so I'll take that as a positive. This may, maybe there's a little bit of community. We're almost to halfway, though. It'll be surprising. Our first exam, I'll talk softer. Our first exam is next Thursday. So on Tuesday, I'll spend class time re reviewing. We'll talk about what the exam will be. <coughs> The exam will be primary vocabulary, and I'll give you the essay questions. Okay, so next Tuesday, important to, to be here. So now, Tuesday? so today's Thursday. Yeah, so like a week today. Is next Thursday is our first exam. Is anyone planning on being sick? Anyone planning on not you you already? <laughs> yeah, on Tuesday I'll give you all those worksheets back but it'll be 70, 80% vocabulary. S did you say sweet? Yeah. I thought that was gone. I we st still said that. Say that. Really? Matching. So believe me now and hear me later that that is true. That's what I'll do. Matching so vocabulary? Yes. And so if you don't know the vocabulary, you'll be in trouble. If you know it really well, you'll be in good shape for about 80%. Is it going to be definitions or is it going to be like? Yes. So, you might be. If you're looking for one hour, I suggest you consider this. If you're looking for one credit hour, uh, to learn parliamentary procedure. In, in agriculture, parliamentary procedure has always been important because within agriculture, uh, producers and lay people are, are the decision makers. They serve on school boards and co-op boards and bank boards and where otherwise in other industries, uh, everyday people do not serve People in agriculture serve and need to know how to participate in a meeting. Traditionally, high school ag education programs did a very good job of that, but I realize that now many of you may have graduated and, and have not known really how to use parliamentary procedure. An FFA meeting was something, was a show that was put on, and you really didn't learn how to make motions, amendments, divide the question, all those kind of things. If you have, great, but I don't need it. But if not, you may be interested, and it's a value, I think, to anyone. This came across my desk. You may all know more about it than I do, but this film, Farmers for America, Agronomy Club is going to screen it. Mike Rowe from Dirty Jobs is the narrator. And so that's the 22nd, which would be next Thursday night, right? In, invite you. I'm going to try to, to be there. They're going to have discussion afterwards. I saw the clip, and it tries to present a, a broad view of, of production agriculture now and what's going on, but um, may, maybe something that you're, you're interested in. Encourage you to, uh, to go if you can. Okay, it's kind of late. It's like 7 o'clock. Yeah, some people are tired. Um, okay, I've got, I feel like really wonky here. I've got so much time and so little to do. Um, strike that, reverse it. Um, not where I want to be. church in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, put a to-go order in at Outback Steakhouse. Does this sound familiar to anybody? 25 steaks, 25 chickens, and 25 baked potatoes. It came out to $735. It was takeout. Came up there, they call, 
Outback brings it out, and the person that brought it out, they didn't tip them. Okay. Anyway, the person that brought the takeout food out to them, they were not tipped, and so they went to, to social media and complained that here this church, I guess the church is supposed to have a lot of money. I don't know why they were, but, but anyway, this, this mega church uh, and, and stiffed me. Okay? And then the church responded and said, uh, we didn't realize the takeout that I should have done that and the server was fired. Um, because you're, they're not allowed to post negative things about their establishment on, uh, on social media. Any thoughts on that relative to our discussion of the concept of tipping? The server the server posted on, on social media that here this church came, got this big order, and didn't tip me. So you would call that what, public shaming? When someone does something bad, you go to social media and you say, hey, they were, they, you, anyway. Do you normally tip? That's a really good question. What the rest of you think? You normally tip when there's a takeout? Samantha? You think so, or? Here, let me just concentrate just on one person. A lot of places that I go, like they work the tip is like the bill, like it's the take automatically. Well, usually if it's if it's a certain number of parties, if it's, they'll say like eight or ten, we're going to put eighteen percent on. But takeout, I don't think that is that way. But that's that's interesting. That's how. You know, but they'd say we don't know how many people. Maybe they you're really hungry, and I need those twenty-five chickens and those twenty-five um, baked potatoes. So we don't know how many, and so takeout policy, I'm guessing, does not cover that. Anybody else? Wait, just thoughts? I yes? I feel like they didn't have to work too hard. You don't know their um, work ethic if they just want the bag and go take it. Well, when you work to go. When, when you, when, when, so you're the person that went to pick it up. This person brings the food to you. You would say, well, they didn't, I don't know what they did, so why would I give them anything, right? I worked at Chili's, and we had a to-go station, and, like, the person who works to go like place the food in a to-go box. So like they're the ones that are going back and forth in the kitchen and making sure that you have everything. That's what the server says. The said I, I spend a lot of time. Like, you're still like it's just the same thing as going and sitting down at a restaurant and being a waitress. It's just you're just running into the curb and you're not like waiting on them hand and foot. You're not dining. Experience. Yeah, except that you just a server that just brings the food to you. Do you, do you think about so if someone brings the food to my table? Do you think oh well I need to pay them? because they brought the food, that, that's the analogy. I brought the food to the car versus I went to and ordered it at a station and they brought it out to me like, uh, you go to Wendy's and they give you a placard. Do you, do you tip those people where they bring the food to you? But typically the person that works to go, like when, we worked, when I worked at Chili's, we didn't, it wasn't really <coughs> common that you got tips if you worked in to go. There you go. We never really had like a to go on and if you were like clocked in as a to go, you got paid as opposed to a server who was has eight tables in the dining room and having to do to go. Okay, so they kind of knew that the to-go people aren't going to tip or you're not going to, yeah. not regularly. Nobody ever okay. how, how would that concept of eliminating tipping uh, take care of this problem? She'd still have her job. Uh, she would still have her job and she wouldn't have anything to complain about because we don't allow tipping, okay? Yeah. Other thoughts? Good, good question. No answer. Ross says, "What, what should I tip when it's to go? They haven't done much for me." I bet you will now because you're an innovator. <laughs> any, any thoughts on what's appropriate? Because my initial reaction, I wouldn't give them anything. And Penny says, "Oh, I always would do that. I don't think I ever get takeout. You would." I tip Sonic. Yeah, people with my money. Yeah, I end up doing that. Penny will get a super diet cherry coke or something. I'll give them two bucks for a dollar fifty. I'm kind of embarrassed. Uh, it's like this is crazy, but you some you're, and that's what you're saying. They're just bringing you something. But they have to work to bring it to you. I mean, like I've this got girl, to do she had to put it all together. Yeah. You know. I think with like a big order like that, you should tip just because not only if you're having 25 of this, 25 of that, it can't just be one person doing that whole order. So she's gonna have to see. She's gonna have to have other people putting in their effort to put in that huge sure. order. So, so I think that a tip would be necessary for that, but if it was just like one or two orders, uh, then I wouldn't tip because technically they're not doing that much work, but the cooks are. So if you're mm -hmm. using a credit card, I know a lot of restaurants do it where credit cards go and um, give the kitchen that 
Yeah, we were talking you. about that the yeah. other day. Yeah. So that's what I would do, but I just think that would be kind of rude if you're ordering all this stuff and then not giving them a tip for wasting or putting all of their time into one um, order for that one person. Yeah, and then the other thing that complicates it, it's a church, and so it's some volunteer is showing up and it's like, it's not my money. Uh, I guess we take, need to take money out of the coffers to make sure you get tipped. Anyway, so it's so complicated. And, and so Ross, it, it really hits at it. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Again, that concept of not tipping takes all that off the equation. It's, it's just like, I had a guy, like a big company, $4 tab, he's like, it's my company card. He's like, I can't put a tip on it. Like, oh, is that what he said? $100. Right. So, so if I yeah. buy hideaway but pizza on the like university, I can like, put. You know, like, it's hard to show like on like a church is like you know like how a big like expensive like a tip, but they should take it on personally to do that. Yeah. Speaking from a yeah, person so like who would. Someone that survives yeah. like mm-hmm. paycheck to paycheck on tips. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I think we build it in. And, and, that, and, and, that, and that's what Shake Shack guy said. I'm just going to build it in. We don't have to worry about this then. You're going to get paid what you need to get paid. Uh, we don't stiff anybody. The, again, the gal still have her job. Yep. So all good. But she should never want to post me. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, I would never go post like, blah, blah, with this company. Like, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> don't ever come back to this place. Wait, did they tag? Oh yeah, oh, all God. that. <laughs> because because that's what I want to do. I want to publicly shame these people. I thought because you were just saying like a church ordered this today and it didn't tip me. I didn't know no, how, how, what kind of revenge do you get there? You want to make sure that okay, you want this to get back to the people that it needs to get back to, and then and 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 um, after the incident, a few families from the church gave her a sum that was more than the tip, but she's still out of a job. The church told Palm Beach Post that the t- lack of tip was an oversight, uh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but this whole tipping thing creates all these problems. And again, this innovation of not tipping or the, of stopping this innovation of tipping uh, straightens out a bunch of, bunch of things. Okay. Again, I got so many different things. On your homework, there were two items that I should have gotten to to explain before you had a chance to work on them. So I want to spend a little bit of time just talking about them, the, the Eastern Red Cedar and the Bradford Pear. And so um, let me start with Eastern Red Cedar just because we're at Land Grant University and we do this all the time. Just a little bit more about the... And so you, you, get a little, you get a little agricultural uh, information besides social change. And one of the projects that we want to talk about today is the issue of eastern red cedar in Oklahoma. Joining us now is our water resource specialist, Don Turton. And, and Don, let's uh, talk about the eastern red cedar and, and why it's important to look a little more closely at it, especially in a state like Oklahoma. Okay, so first, they're a plant that's not native to the... To, to Oklahoma. Okay, the uh, problem with eastern red cedar is pretty well known in Oklahoma. We have about 17 million acres of uh, prairie land, shrubland, uh, cross timbered forests, and other forest types in the state. And it was estimated uh, a few years ago by the Natural Resource and Conservation Service that by 2013, about 12.6 million acres of that 17 will be encroached with eastern red cedar. And that's basically where there are about 50 cedar trees per acre. And uh, that number is increasing uh, every year. Uh, we all know about uh, the fact that uh, red cedar, of course, uh, reduces the amount of grass on the land, so it reduces the amount of forage, uh, creates problems with pollen, uh, creates fire hazards, and so on. Uh, but one of the other uh, important effects of red cedar is how uh, red cedar affects the water cycle in Oklahoma. Uh, water supply is always an issue, especially in dry years like this. A lot of municipalities use uh, surface runoff that's collected in reservoirs for the water supplies. And if eastern red cedar uses a, a significantly uh, more water, uh, it could reduce the amount of water that's available for water supply or for groundwater recharge. And that's 
that's one of the things we're uh, basically looking at in this project is we're studying in uh, quite a bit of detail uh, the difference in water use between uh, red cedar and, uh, and grass. And let's talk a little bit about... And so we can watch the, the whole thing, but the eastern red cedar are able to survive. They take water that other trees and grasses need. That's why you have big barren areas around red cedar. Used to be just confined when we had wildfires everywhere. They were confined to valleys and, and canyons where fire wouldn't, wouldn't reach, but they've just consumed uh, large areas. Uh, and as you drive, you'll see them everywhere. When we had wildfires, the wildfires were a real problem. Red cedars, because the oil in, and when fire would hit it, it'd be like a torch going up. And so once the wind would be blowing, like it's gonna be today, 20, 30 mile an hour, it would just go from tree to tree to tree, and just, if you had those around your house, there's no way your house was gonna, gonna survive. So eastern red cedar, as a plant, that we wanna encourage people to cut down, okay? They propagate by the little blue uh, juniper berries. Birds eat those, and then they deposit them uh, around as they, as they poop around the area. Where I'm from, uh, asparagus grows wild or has escaped cultivation and always be growing along the fences. And I remember saying to my dad one time, I said, how come, the, how come the asparagus are all growing along the fence? And he said, well, birds eat those red berries. And I said, yeah, I understand that. And I said, how come they're along the fence? <laughs> and, and it was like the, when he had to explain male and female couplings on the, on the hose one time to me. I'm like, you know, pl please explain to me this, and then afterwards I um, uh, felt a little um, ashamed that I didn't really understand that. But sometimes you just have to paint me a picture completely. But yeah, they sit on the fence, they poop out, and then they, they germinate. So why we have them along fences all the time is a problem, which is the same problem we have with, with the Bradford pear. Is that the Americans edible? Oh yeah. And so we'd always have the problem townies that would come out and they, you'd see them park along and they're going to harvest asparagus out of your fence row and it's like, you know, just plant your own asparagus. Uh, same people that would come out and want to hunt when my dad would say, you know, next July when we're bailing hay, why don't you come out and help and then I don't mind you come out and you can go pheasant hunting, but just to come out and, and reap where you don't sow. Um, but yeah, anyway, wild it's not wild, it's just escape cultivation. So we're, we're about there. It's the first tree to bloom. It's massive white blooms. Before, before the eastern red bud are going to bloom, you're going to have Bradford pear, and it's going to be a complete show of white. And here you have some, and then some that are past, past bloom. So we're about, we're about two or three weeks away from seeing this. So all of this has just grown here because of birds primarily, yep. and maybe have come from the neighborhood nearby Absol from plants and grasses. Absolutely. Okay, so what happens when uh, your field looks like this? How do we manage this? Well, if you have just small seedlings, small minimal burning can kill those seedlings, but once you have established trees like this, they'll re-sprout. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the eastern red cedar, the junipers, we can cut at ground level and we're okay. These we, we cut and they still are going to re-sprout. So it's like twice as bad or 10 times more difficult to control. I can cut this down, but it's going to re-sprout. And again, so they're, they're small. And if it's an area where you mow all the time, no problem. But where it's an area where you don't mow, now you've got, instead of having pasture land or native oaks, you have just uh, Bradford pears. So 
So uh, you have to use some type of herbicide to control to keep them from re-sprouting. And they can either be cut and herbicide applied to the, the, the base of the tree, or you can inject it into the stem. It's different methods. Okay, so at this point, our, our problem's gotten worse because the trees have gotten bigger. And, and what you mentioned is diversified birds. What kind of birds are attracted to this type of tree? Uh, lots of different birds, but actually one of the more common wildlife damage. And actually, that doesn't really matter what kind of birds. But I, again, I wanted, if you weren't familiar with those two, I wanted to make sure you were familiar with before we, before we got into this. Okay, let me... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to this. Right, you just cannot, cannot pull them up and they have big thorns on them and they are, they're, they're awful. And so when we get to that, when we talk about this today, I want to wanna address that. Um, innovations. colder it is, the further down, where? Okay. If you like to ski, you want one of those that have the tail on, so when you're going down the slopes, you like people to take pictures that you can't see it, obviously, because you're going down the, the slopes. Relative advantage? Holly? What's the relative advantage of this? Okay, if I pull it down over my ears, it's going to keep, and my head, you lose most of your heat through your head, okay? And so it's why you're encouraged dusty, so you're, you're nice and warm there with your, your cap on, George. And so depending on how cold it is, that cap may keep you ventilated and back. Okay, a nice day. Tomorrow you might want to put on your winter cap. You're going to lose that heat. So a summer cap would be one that might be ventilated in back. Am I recording? Okay. Um, so this would be an innovation if you were from Friendswood, Texas, maybe, and you went skiing or you moved to Wisconsin or Montana, okay? Is it observable? Yes, you can see that other people are wearing it, okay? Is it trialable? How would I try it? I would have to buy it, okay? A little, little bit difference there, okay? The concern if it's in grade school, this is a great way to, to share head lice, okay? And again, every one of the little girls that came to our house when they arrived all had head lice, um, which is, anyway, and so, but anyway, and so it happens in schools, <laughs> kids' coats are next to each other, they put on somebody else's hat or gloves. Is it complex? It is not. Is it compatible? Oh, now somebody, somebody, contradict that and say it is not compatible with, and then you might have to fill in the blank. Where you live. Not compatible with where you live. Excellent. Any other compatibility issue? Um, okay. Uh, depending on how expensive it might be as far as the quality goes. What kind of hair you have? What does it do? I don't know if it'll be on long enough, but it will mat down your hair. If you're from Friendswood, Texas, where it's small town, big hair, that would be a problem. You wouldn't do that. Okay. So depending on what what your hair was like, it may not be compatible. Anybody else? All right. That was a stretch, but let me stop there because again, okay. Was I? Oh, yeah. Season three? Um, made, made it to the final four? <laughs> oh, now this is not a bandana. This is a scrunchie uh, on Survivor if the girls were small enough they wore this as a tube top. So you can look for a lot of things, but I like to wear it like this. As a do rag. Okay. So what is the... I'm sorry, what is the relative advantage? You look cool. I look cool. Dominique? You look like a biker. Dominique, relative advantage of this? He said I look cool. Can you think of any relative advantage of this? Why would someone wear one of these? Uh, when you put on your motorcycle, 
<laughs> yes, I, th this would be a, a skull cap, right? And it would it would help for my for my helmet that it would uh, make it such. Any other thoughts? If you, so you don't get a um, bumper on your head. There you go. If I was bald, okay, which I'm not. <laughs> not, not like I had any control over that. I mean, it's just genetics. Would it be perfect to wear, especially when you're out working during the summertime? It. That, that's interesting because there's some problems with that. If I was, so I, when I was doing Cowboy Challenge last, last spring, and, and who, was, who was in class with us, play, football player? Um, who? Jarrell Owens. Jarrell Owens. Okay, and, so, and so I'd complain about, about, we had to do like 20 push-ups, and I said one time to Jarrell, I said, how many push-ups can you do? And he said, uh, at one time? And I said, yeah. He said, 80. I was like, I think I got up to like 12 yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, so you're, it, you were sweating, and so it keeps some of the sweat out of your face. Okay. Any other relative advantage? All right. <coughs> Observ observability? I can see someone. Yeah. You, you just did. But it could be it could be a, a, a handkerchief do rag. Same way. I just I just have this one. Trialable. Yeah. Oh, oh, only in the sense that you say I'm willing to you, to wear one that somebody else said you want. To try, anybody say I want to try it? You you generally don't. Okay. You generally don't. You say can can I Ty can I borrow your hat and wear it? And you'd say. Mm, that's that's my hat. That's kind of like, like borrowing somebody's fingernail clippers. Mm. Is it complex? It is not. Is it compatible? Now here, again, compatibility may be the hardest thing. It's like compatible with your lifestyle or your image or, George, for you, will you adopt this innovation? Is it compatible with being George Perez? It, it is because you're cool. You'd say I, I, you, you would increase your coolness. Okay, sports. You see lots of people. So for you, very compatible. For anybody else, you'd say, Dustin, it's just not part of who I am. I can't see myself wearing it. Well, you're processing this innovation. Where are you on it? You, you, you may adopt this innovation? Were you thinking about something else when I asked you that question? You seemed like kind of a little distracted about that. Where did you get that? Um, this is, uh, I, I am a big Survivor fan. Uh, when it initially came out, my daughter Catherine and I watched it all the time. I wrote a couple papers on the leadership implications of Survivor. Uh, and I, I kind of quit watching it because at first I was sure that it was, it was genuine. And now I'm convinced it's not. Yeah, these are all wannabe actors. Yeah, but anyway, uh, just like Bachelor, I mean they're just yeah. So so you want you, you need to show that you can uh, can make out with somebody else because you'll have to do that in your movie role. So you practice on this guy that you fell in love with and <laughs> convince us. Okay, this. It's kind of fancy one. It's got the side thing. Relative advantage of this? It fits my head. It, it shades my eyes and my brow and my forehead. Anybody wants to, it shades more? My bald spot, which I don't have. Again, but it, nothing I did other than your, if you do this all the time, like Christopher Walken, you know, that, that really helps your, keep you from going. Is I don't know. Is there, uh, other than that, can anyone else got a uh, relative advantage? Is that what it is for all y'all? I didn't want to wash my hair. Does anyone say it's part of my, al part of my outfit? Yeah, okay, okay. Men, men used to wear hats all the time. Do any of you go to church and where in front of the, the pew there's a little button with a little clip? If you're Catholic, where there's a kneeler, the church where I go to, and so it's where men would 
little clip there, and that's where you would put your hat, because every man wore a hat. They wouldn't wear it in church. Okay? A woman might cover her head in church as a show of humility. A man takes off his hat in church as a show of humility. It's kind of odd that it's the opposite, but there's a place for hat. When did men quit wearing hats? Some suggest that that John F. Kennedy, when he was inaugurated, did not wear a hat, and that sent a trend that men stopped wearing hats. My dad wore a hat all the way through the 70s. I always wore a hat, and then all of a sudden he quit, but I'm not sure why. That's what he would call Jackson. He had the Onassis when he started women wearing hats. Those pillbox hats? Looks better with jeans. <laughs> it needs to be it, flatter. You can. Uh, it should be flat, and it's kind of. It was hanging. Okay. Relative advantage. Shade. 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 More. Uh, covers your skin. Protects your skin. My ears. Yeah. At the back of my head. Yeah. And why? And, and why is that important? Protection. Okay. And so who who said uh, so outside? So if I'm going outside in the summer. This is not good protection. This is much better protection. Um, put this on and that. I could. could. What? A mask. Oh, you think I'm like doing something that I need to be concealed on? Okay. So you think of this. You think of this. This image of farmers. Aren't they wearing a big, wide-brim straw hat? Yeah, they're outside, they're in the sun to protect them. So if you're outside, something to protect you, okay? Not this. Okay, it's a wonder, why don't ball players have big hats like this? It'd be like the Amish team, right? <laughs> okay. Is, is this innovation observable? I can see someone. Is it trialable? Okay. Is it complex? Now, lastly, is it compatible or does it have compatibility problems? Try not to see how you look. Hello. Hello. I think it looks. I think it looks good on you. And so, if it's windy, if it's windy, you got that. Well, that would be a little bit different. Then you, it's your Arkansas look. No, I'm telling you right here. No, I'm saying if the wind's coming. Oh, you could. Okay, I want it back now. Oh. <laughs> Does anyone, and it's really about whether you're going to adopt or not, the complex, the compatibility part. But it is kind of funny, you don't wear somebody else's, yeah. It's not very compatible and very high. Even when you go next track, it's still. Okay, so, okay, I'll talk softer. So, it, so where it's very windy, even this, you know, so it might go like this, <laughs> right, or a branch might, might catch you, okay? Does anyone else, does anyone else have, what? Oh, the pin is the going to the Sun Road uh, in Montana, Glacier National Park, the 75th anniversary. Anyone have compatibility problems with this? It doesn't fit them. Dusty, does it fit you more? And it, you wouldn't you wouldn't seem as desirable wearing it, okay? And so this idea of I don't think I would look good in it. Penny has one like it. I think she's worn it twice. Uh, she's going to a junk auction. She's out in the sun. This is what she should be wearing. Protect it really would cool a lot. But the compatibility, it's not that it's not doesn't fit my head. It's the compatibility is whether it fits kind of how I do things, okay? And again, what Roger says is these five things explain most of whether an innovation is adopted or not. He says I think between 46 and 87 percent, depends, there's a few other things, but this explains whether something's going to be adopted or not. And if you check the box on all of them, there's a good chance that it's going to be Adopted, and if there's one of them missing, then we've got problems that we're going to have to overcome. Okay. And again, this—why I say it's been overadopted. 
Why do I say it's been overadopted? Well, that yeah, that's evidence that it's that it was overadopted. Or because everyone has multiple of them, but you don't wear them all the time. Yeah, that's a, that's further evidence it's been overadopted. They have they have many of them. How is it that it was adopted when there seems to be very small relative advantage? So why is it that people adopted this innovation when the relative advantage is so small? For girls, the relative advantage is really big. Explain it, that to me. You don't have to wash your hair if you have mine. You don't have to. It's easy to do. You just mm -hmm. wake up, pull your hair through, and you're ready. And, and you don't have to wash your hair. Yeah. Exactly. So, so it, it keeps you from not having to wash your hair. Yep. All right. And so you'd say that's really big. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? So that's the, the female yep. perspective. I didn't know why guys were. Guys are. Oh, <laughs> older men or younger yeah. men who are in denial might cover up a bald spot, and 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 you can't tell, you can't tell that I'm that I'm I'm bald. It's like a girl stereotype. Gotcha. What about for the for you other men? They think it's stylish. Okay, they think it looks good. What about this? Okay. I, I see people wear their hat like this, and, and what have we done? Those th the relative advantage that we talked about, there's no relative advantage. Why am I wearing this? It's not protecting my eyes, my forehead. That, I have a fishing hat like that that has the back part on it. Okay, or this. What the heck? Anyway. My, I have an older brother, and whatever's on these, what's yours say, Blanco? What is that? What does yours say? I'm sorry. Okay. My, my brother will take, and underneath it, there's like a hole. He takes and takes the stitching out, and he said, I'm not going to give anybody free advertising. He also, when he buys a, a vehicle, whatever the stickers are, he rips them off. Why does he even buy a blank hat? Yeah. Because those. That would, he would have to buy it. These are all free. <coughs> so, do you know these two farmer jokes? Why, why do hats go like this? It's from farmers looking in the mailbox for that subsidy check. <laughs> do, you, do, you know why, do you know why farmers don't wear tennis shoes? No. It's the only thing seed corn companies don't give away. <laughs> Aren't those awful? Oh my God. There were, there were three dogs outside the butcher shop window. There was a farmer's dog, a banker's dog, and, and a robber's dog. And the robber's dog says, let's bust into that butcher shop and steal those steaks. Oh, this being recorded. And the banker's dog says, let's go down to the bank, get a loan, and go buy those steaks. And the farmer's dog says, maybe we just sit out here and whine about it long enough, somebody will give them to us. <laughs> anyway. Okay, I gotta gotta redirect here. There's the case study, there's the case study in this text called The Daughter in Law Who Doesn't Speak. Okay. Does anyone remember reading that case study? Several of you. Gage, what does that mean? What is the daughter in law who doesn't speak? It looks like a machine that you could have several delivery devices up to one with like peanut smasher. To make to make peanut butter. Why was it called the daughter-in-law who doesn't speak? I, this was kind of implied. Maybe because now she has time to rest, and so she wasn't all the time having to work and having to do these things. Too. Why the daughter-in-law? Oh, did anybody? Samantha? Yes. And, and so, again, I spent uh, some time in Ethiopia about 10 or 15 years ago, and I was picked up in Addis Ababa, 
and, and brought back, we had like a two hour ride, and the director of the school brought me and his wife um, was along. And four or five times on the way on this two hour drive, she pointed out to me that who does all the work in Ethiopia are the women, the children, and the old men, okay? The young men sit around and drink coffee and talk to each other all day long. They don't work. The women do all the work. And so the daughter-in-law who doesn't speak is the daughter-in-law or the women did all this work and now, again, it doesn't speak. It does the work and does everything except talk, okay? And I want to talk about this innovation because there's other ones that are, that are similar. And this one you may, you may be familiar with. Or ground nuts. Shelled nuts are the most valuable, but it's a painfully slow process. Now, a simple machine designed in the American peanut belt by inventor Jock Brandes can shell the nuts 60 times faster. 60 times faster than by hand. I was in West Africa and I saw some women shelling peanuts. Their, their fingers were. were they informed me that they had to do this and well into the night because that's the only product they're going to be able to take to market the next morning and actually get any real value for. And then one of the women there said when I, when I went back to America, could I find a simple hand-operated peanut shower uh, and send it back to them because that's what they really needed. Uh, so, of course. North Carolina, USA is prime peanut growing country. In Brandsville, adopted home state, there's not much they don't know about growing and processing peanuts. If a hand-operated shower had ever been used, Brandis couldn't find it. So he invented one, and then set up an NGO, the Full Belly Project, to get his shelling machine design into Okay, so as we go through this, try and think about these five things. Relative advantage, we already figured out, 60 times, okay? In the daughter-in-law who doesn't speak, they said the men liked this thing too. Do you remember why the men liked it? They said their wives' hands were softer and they weren't as tired. <laughs> Not tonight, dear, I'm tired. Okay, so the men had, had some interest in this innovation and my guess is this, this same one. What's interesting here is, again, how, they, how this innovation works and how they tried to get it adopted. So we'll go watch a little bit more. We simply make a factory in a box with really good instructions. The box gets sent somewhere, they open it up, and they can start turning out one, two, three, five, as many showers as they want. The Full Belly Project supplied one of their box factories to Lamek Makutu of C2C Engineering in Malawi, Malawi's capital. So we send you the kit, and then you make it. Because compared to what we already do, the only difference being that the full bear products are cement based, but also with an element of steel work. So we just had to take the knowledge and uh, started producing the natural. And so then a company in that Some country the makes them and sells them. A little bit of uh, expertise. It has to be done by someone who can assemble them nicely, work the pieces together nicely, so that they don't break when they're shelling. So as a new product, most people don't know how to operate it. So we, we, we give the basic training on how to operate it, how to service it. The operation of the shell is just by rotating the handle. So an inside cone and an outside cone, the cones. It doesn't require that much energy. You can move it by one hand. And here when you're shelling, because peanuts are in different sizes, there's some that is going to escape through and some that will break. So this has to be set so that you've got very little breakage. So you can do fine adjustments. So he's saying it's adjustable. If you lower the cone down, you are increasing the gap between the two cones. Uh, so that will accommodate uh, bigger nuts. But you can see most of the nuts are somewhat complete. See? Nice. It is good and relevant. Civil engineering is oriented to help 
global format. So when we looked at the products, they were in line with our program, the way we do things. The products we do here, they are designed and meant to help our own local farmers here in Malawi. We spend a lot of time to sell peanuts. So if you give them a machine, simple manual operated, that is going to sell peanuts, it will free up their time. They will have more time to do other productive things. Okay, so you get this idea. The advantage is, is women don't have to spend all the time doing this, they could do something more productive. Which is this whole thing that we started class with about this innovation of farming. If not everybody has to go look for food, they could do other things, okay? So if some people are growing food, everyone doesn't have to grow food, what do the people do that aren't growing food? Well, if we, if we go back 11,000 years, we would say, so you jumped too far ahead on me, Ross, but 11,000 years ago, if everybody didn't, what could people do that weren't growing food? They could go, they could build uh, places for us to live. Excellent. Anything else? They could hunt. They, they could go and we could get some delicacies. We'd have, you know, prosciutto. We could maybe learn how to cure meats. How about that? Maybe we learn how to make plaster. Maybe we sit around and draw all day long and we make paintings and sell to those people that are farmers. Maybe we uh, develop, we sit around and think about things and we develop a religion, okay? We develop weapons and then based on our religion we go and kill the people that aren't of our religion, I think. Anyway, not all good things happen when, when people do farm. Lifting people out of poverty often means lifting them out of and then Ross says, now so you can go to school, you don't have to do peanuts every day. Edward Britton Strong explained how the shallot helped to save lives. Not only stops the sudden. Okay, so got that. From last chapter, we talk about reinvention. This one's real short. An inexpensive peanut shelling machine has often been referred to as the holy grail of sustainable agriculture. Okay, that's what you just saw. Jock Brandis, living in Wilmington, North Carolina, has invented just such a machine. Returning to the States and working in his backyard, he developed an inexpensive, durable, and easily replicated peanut shelling machine. Okay. I don't know if you can see that, but it's a little bit different. Rather than having these cones, they just used five gallon buckets. And so rather than those, they have a few metal pieces, but not near as many. And so they took this innovation and said, we can make it better. They reinvented it. I think. And so then they're at a school and they're some Portland cement, some sand. And so you can have locally some company can make those or make the forms and sell to other people. And so we can scale it up and we've obviously reduced the, the cost some. I'll just fast forward that a little bit. Observability.
we, we saw people using it. Yeah, I can watch that and say, gosh, I need one of those. <laughs> Trialable. I, I could borrow it for a day and then take it back and say, we need one of those. Okay, again, better than even than the hat. Complexity seemed pretty simple. Okay, they, had, they said, we've got some simple instructions. You need to find some cement and some sand. Probably have that. And a few metal pieces that maybe you can buy or maybe those would be donated. Compatibility. We either we're shelling by hand or we're having this machine. And we're, uh, very compatible. And we can do it 60 times faster. Okay. One part that I, that I didn't include in, in the worksheet are incentives. And Roger says the incentives will speed up the adoption. Okay, so we're going to offer you incentives to get you to adopt. That will be faster than if there wasn't any. Okay? Okay. Now, what kind of incentives are there? Okay. So... One is we could simply give you money to adopt, or we could give you something and you would adopt it. Okay? We can either give you money if you'll do it, or we can give you whatever it is that we want you to adopt. We can't be sure that you're going to use it, but we can put it in your hands. Okay? Another is is we would give money not to you, but to somebody else. Okay. Uh, about 10 years ago, Monsanto was trying to introduce winter canola into Oklahoma. Winter canola is planted at the same time winter wheat is planted, has a yellow flower, canola seed is then pressed, you get canola meal, like you have soybean meal, and you have canola oil, which is like soybean oil, but better for you. Okay. Also used for, to produce ethanol. And so, how do we get Oklahoma farmers to grow canola? They had the idea that they would go to farmers and they would say, if you will plant 40 acres of canola, we will give you the seed and we will give the FFA chapter in your community $5,000. We gave you the seed. You had to do the fertilizer and have the land and do whatever. But we will give somebody else some money, somebody that you would like to. I'm on a game show host, I'm on a game show, and you get, instead of money, we give it to the charity of your choice. Okay. So if I adopt, maybe you don't get it, but somebody else gets it. Still with me? Okay. We'll punish you if you don't adopt. Think this through. If you don't adopt this innovation, we will punish you. Okay. Do we want everyone to have health care insurance? We do. Because if you don't have health care insurance, you show up in the emergency room when you're too sick, and so then we all pay for that because hospitals have to do out of the gratuity. Okay. How do we get people to buy health insurance? If they don't buy health insurance, we will fine you, okay? And that, with the, with the last reform tax, that was taken out. But a lot of Republicans were against Obamacare because it had a mandate, which is if you don't buy insurance, we're going to charge you the, it anyway. So we, we fo we're forcing you to do it. Okay. Can you think of anything else we want you to do, and if you don't, you're going to be in trouble. Car if, so lots of states have mandatory car insurance. You have to carry car insurance if you're going to drive. Okay? Anything else? When they have the one child policy in China, if they have more than one child, they have to taxes. Okay, so if we're trying to control population, we may say only one child, but if you have more than one child, you're going to have to pay, and so it's substantial. I want you to wear a seatbelt, and if you don't, we'll give you a ticket. 
And what do you get with that ticket? Golden ticket? No, you have to pay money. So we are going to make it. Do you have to wear a motorcycle helmet? I don't know, is Oklahoma is? Okay. But some people would like that to be, okay? So one way is we will punish you if you don't do what we want you to do, okay? And usually punishment is, is dollars, okay? Mostly we're talking about behaviors. Um, I want all dogs to be vaccinated for rabies. How am I going to get that to happen? I'll give you money if you vaccinate your dog. You're required. You have to have your dog rabies vaccination. You have to have the tag. And so if you don't, there's a fine that goes with that. Okay? If I wanted to have, I thought all dogs and cats had to be spayed or neutered. We could fine you if you had an intact dog or cat. Okay? So we can give you money to adopt. We can give somebody else money for you to adopt. We can punish you if you don't adopt. Okay? Um, we could give you something other than money. And we can have a delayed incentive. And a delayed incentive is later on you're going to get something. Okay? All preventative innovations are delayed incentives. Okay? You're going to get something later. Eye contact, I thought maybe, you know, that would, you're saying, I don't understand. Ross, this is a tough one. What do you think? Um, Just give me the preventative innovation and I'll give you the incentive that comes later. Okay, the, that's so I don't get a ticket. Okay, the the delay is it might not happen today, but later on I won't get a ticket. All right. Anyone else? Dental floss. A what? Dental floss. Every day I use dental floss so that. The the incentive will come later when I go to the dentist and they say you do not have a cavity. Okay? Anybody else? We keep going a little bit. <coughs> Sunscreen. I don't get something which is skin cancer. Okay, again the problem is again with all preventative innovations this relative advantage is down the road and that's why it's hard. Some sooner than others. Okay? If I know that I eat spicy food, I'll have an upset stomach, okay? But I love spicy food. The incentive is not to do that, but it'll be sooner than, than you'd like, okay? Or eat too much, okay? I want people to buy electric cars. I'm the government and I want people to buy to buy electric cars. Yes, that's why. What's the incentive I can offer to get people to buy an electric car? You are the U.S. government. Cash for clunkers was a really interesting concept because what we're trying to do is we're trying to support the automobile industry. And so we're trying to get people, we're trying to get the automobile industry to sell cars. And so we're going to take government and we are going to give you a money for your old car so that if you will go and buy one of these new cars to, well, that will help out, uh, help out the automobile industry and keep GM and, and the Ford and, and Chrysler afloat, which marginally did that. At least we didn't shut down all these, these factories. 
Yes. And so what Pam said is, I can give you a tax rebate. Okay. And so about this time of year, as some of us are doing taxes, I would say to my dad things like, well, I pay taxes. And my dad would say, what taxes do you pay? And I'd say, uh, pay sales tax. And he'd say, yeah, yeah, I guess maybe you do. You don't pay income tax because you don't make any money. You don't have any property, so you don't pay any property tax. He'd say, you don't really pay much tax at all. I'd say, I resemble that remark. The tax rebate comes when it comes time to pay taxes. And so the U.S. government wants me to put solar power in, geothermal, wants me to use uh, CFLs, wants me to buy an electric car, and tells me that then next year when I go to pay taxes, they'll give me a break on my taxes. They don't give me money, but essentially they do because the money I was going to have to pay, they'll give back to me. Okay? So it's a delayed incentive. Okay, it's not right away. That coupon was right away. At point of purchase, I'm saving a dollar on Quaker Oats. Okay, what's a rebate? It's like when you buy, oh, this is what it is. Uh, you're right. It's, it's when you buy something. How does it work, though? You Macy? have to, like, mail it in. Um, like and then they'll send you. Yeah, you have to mail in a form, proof of purchase, and they'll send you fifty, ten dollar, whatever. That's what a rebate is. Okay, is it delayed? It is. How many people actually send in the rebate form and have the receipt? It's not laying on their counter, and after it expires, they assume just like gift cards, they won't all be redeemed. How many gift cards get thrown in a drawer, get thrown out with the wrapping paper, whatever? Okay, but it's delayed. And what Roger says is, these are different ways. We do incentives to try and speed up adoption, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. And he says about it, he says that incentives will increase the, increase the rate of adoption. They'll get people to adopt that otherwise wouldn't adopt. And, and what you're, from your quiz, the quality of adoption won't be very good, but the quantity of adoption will go up. And that means is people will adopt, but they won't be really, really vested. Okay? There was a study that was done on a beach. They were giving out samples of sunscreen. Okay? And then a couple miles down the beach, they were selling sunscreen. And they found those that were given samples of sunscreen were more likely to buy sunscreen further down the beach. The sample okay, got me started, <coughs> got me to try it because it didn't cost me anything. And so if I can get you to try it, okay, still with me? Okay. What about like an incentive for like, I guess it would be kind of like a coupon. A lot of like boutiques now are like having like model, not models, but like, do like reps. Yeah, like reps. And you can use like a code that they send you there. So they can make like the turnout rate not happen. Tell me more how that works. Like. Give me something specific I can. Like a out. boutique would like. Anybody? I'm not sure. What, what do we What do we want to get happen? We want to bring more customers to us. Right. Yeah, like it, like it's to get it out on social media and get like more marketing out. But it's just it's it's for your your your. So if so if you offer it to me and I, if I post it, I get a discount. If I go and buy stuff, or anybody gets a discount. Everybody. Anybody oh. who uses that. Code. Oh well, cer certainly here. I'm I'm just like a coupon. I'm giving you some. I'm giving you some break to, and if buying is adopting, you get, you get something, okay? This, this one also says that, that it's possible to have a finder's fee, okay? Let, let, me, let me give you this. Um, OSU wants more graduates, okay? And every year there are people that leave maybe one sh course or two courses short of graduation. And I've said to the dean before, I said, 
you know what you need to do is you need to offer a bounty on them. For every student that's like six hours short of graduation, that's been out five or more years, if I get them to graduate, you need to give me 50 bucks. Some incentive for me to change my behavior, which is to go to those students who have left school and try and get them graduated. Because once you leave, they're gone. Okay? And so I had a kid, a kid, he's got teenagers, called and said, hey, I, I left 14 years ago, didn't graduate, what would it take to graduate? I looked it all up, did all the paperwork, one class. Ag Leadership 24-3, it's the second eight weeks. You graduate if you want. He's like, how much does it cost? The other would be is if it didn't cost him anything, he would have jumped on it, but it's going to cost $300. He probably doesn't really want to do it. That would cost him a pair of boots or something. The NCAA started going back to the athletes. Talk more. Um, so a lot of times student athletes, if they go um, and they become professional athletes, they may not graduate. NCAA will now um, pay your tuition if they come back. Because they want graduates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you just got to figure out what it is you want, and then you figure out how to do that. And so there's a possibility for incentives. Other thoughts? Okay, if you have your worksheet with you, great. Let's talk through this. The control of eastern red cedars, so we talked about that. These cedars are taking over. We've also got the same for Bradford pear. What's the relative advantage? That's what I'm talking about. The eastern red cedar or the Bradford pear, it's going to be the same for either one. What's the relative advantage of cutting them down? Yes, it will reduce the spread. Yeah, even in your area, if, if it's so other plants will, will do better, will grow. Something will grow instead of being bare ground underneath. Okay? Okay, so those are all good things. Okay, I'm, I'm going to come back to a personal situation. Um, the second one was compatibility. How compatible is it with whatever? How compatible is cutting down trees. I put not very compatible because you have to fully commit. So like can't, can't put it back. It's like cutting off the two by four. I can't put two inches back. Excellent. Samantha? Yeah. Some, anybody else? I said it was compatible with like people who, I mean, like say you like run cattle and you're out there like picking up trash. Okay, so per, for, pro, for producers. So you're going to be out there anyway, so might as well take care of it while you're out there. All right. So where, where we live, it was completely infested, and so I cut down massive amounts, piled them up, and one morning, about 7 o'clock before school started, when things started green up, I went out there and burned one of the brush piles. And Catherine looks out her bedroom window, and she thought the world was on fire. And she was so mad. Dad, what are you doing? You're burning nature. Why are you doing that? You're putting all this carbon into the atmosphere. So not everybody thinks cutting down a tree is a good idea. Some people would think every tree is, is God's work and is, should be there. Don't cut it down. Let it grow. Fruit, multiply. Not everyone sees somebody out there with a chainsaw as doing something good. Okay, and so in that sense, not compatible. How complex is it? Pruner's chainsaw. If you've never operated a chainsaw, chainsaws are complex, also dangerous. Is it trialable? No, it's not trialable. After you cut down, it's too late. Is it observable? Yes, I can see them being cut down. Okay. Bradford Pear. Along our driveway, there are, there were more, but now there are four large Bradford Pears that are about this big. In the spring, they bloom and they smell bad. Okay? But they're white blooms when nothing else is blooming, and a person that lives in my house says they are beautiful. Don't cut them down. How do I convince her that they need to be cut down? Show her that video. Not convinced. They're so pretty, though. How, how, how bad would you be in the bell cut if you just went out there and cut them? 
Well, a couple have disappeared, but I know that they can't all disappear without someone knowing that. They are not that close, but they are along a driveway. So, no, no, they're not. They're not that close, and they're very. They again, they're enormous. So when they bloom, they are. They they are beautiful. And and so this person that lives in my house is like. There are lots of other people that think just like she does. That would take care of my situation, but how do I take care of all those other people that are just like her? How do I convince her? So let me ask you, are there some incentives? And Okay, now, not, now not, not for me, but the things you talked about, that relative advantage was they're good for society because it's my neighbors. I can't, the birds don't just come and eat those berries and poop just on my property. They go across the way. The same for the cedar. I, it's not just me who benefits or who, who is hurt. It's my everyone around because birds fly other places. So if you were in the government position, are you interested in, in this? Gage says we could make it to where it's illegal to have one, and if you have one, it's going to cost you money. And which of those would that be? I'm going to punish you. I'm going to punish you if you have one. I'm going to fine you money. And so if you've got enough money, you think that that's probably what would happen, uh, we, they'd still be there. Any other suggestions? Okay, so we could, we could give you money for what would replace it and say it's going to be just as beautiful. The problem again, my house would be is when will that be? And I'll say, you might not live that long. <laughs> right now, they're really pretty, but that's an excellent idea. We could, at a small cost, offer to replace that tree. Any other ideas? Okay, you've got a, you've got a, a solution. What what have we done with with animals that were terrorizing and eating livestock? How did we convince people to shoot coyotes, wolves? Yes, we would give you money for every tail that you brought in, or hide, or head, or whatever, or ear. We we would pay you for every one that that we could that you would bring in. If you catch a python, uh, lionfish are a, are a problem. So anything that's invasive species is kind of like this. Okay. Increased use of sun, increased use of sunscreen by construction workers. What's the relative advantage, Samantha? Which one? Sunscreen. Okay, it won't get skin cancer, and again, that's a preventative one. How is it compatible? Men and women that are construction workers, see how I didn't gender specific there? Men and women that are construction workers brush their teeth, okay, I think. And you would convince them that they need to put on sunscreen when they brush their teeth? So like you're in the bathroom anyway in the morning, so you just another Interesting. Oh, okay. Let, 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 let's let's do incentives at the end. Is it observable? Dusty. Yeah, different than this. I put it on, and you can, as long as I have it on, you see the sunscreen. I can see and put it on, but then I don't know if they have it on or not. Tough one. But again, but, but but it's so it's so far down the road. That's what makes this one really hard. Is it trialable? We give out samples. Is it complex? It is not. Is it compatible? Think this one through. Is it compatible?
It's compatible if you're used to putting on makeup. If you don't put on makeup, it's kind of different. If guys put on makeup, no big deal. And so I'm going to suggest that for women to put on sunscreen is much different than for men to put on sunscreen. sunscreen. And here is the biggest thing we've got to battle. Okay. okay. On Tuesday, we're going to talk about the exam, have a review, and then next Thursday, our first exam. Okay. We do not. We're, we'll wait and do chapter seven after that exam. So everything will be this first six chapters. Okay? Thank you.